start the recording for the meeting. And uh, with that, I think we can turn it over to Lieutenant Governor to begin the meeting. Great. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I think maybe I'll pop up on your screen now that I'm I'm talking. Uh, it's it's wonderful to see many of you uh, virtually here um, at our, our virtual table as we're, we're getting started. Um, I would just ask again that if you can just make sure that you are are muting um, until you uh, are ready uh, to talk. So we can hear folks um, eight months in. I still have to be reminded uh, multiple times per day. Lieutenant Governor, you're on mute or please mute yourself. So, you know, it's a it's a journey and we're we're all on it together. But although I wish we could be together in person, um, you know, this this is uh, still a, a very exciting day uh, for uh, for me. And I think for for all of us to be a part of uh, this conversation that uh, frankly, is is long overdue. Um, and before I turn it over to our chair, uh, Dr. Gwen Westerman, um, and she officially kicks things off, I just wanted to share uh, a few words with you about uh, why, why we're here um, and what uh, we plan uh, to do with, uh, with our time uh, together. Um, you know, here in Minnesota, uh, we are really proud to have a strong sense of civic engagement. And uh, I think that is uh, demonstrated by us being number one in filling out uh, the census. I predict that we will be number one uh, again for, for voting uh, after uh, next, next week's election. And we make our voices heard at all levels of, of government. And one of those places where we can do that most clearly is at the Capitol, where decision makers hear from Minnesotans from
of a statue yet, nor has it even dived into the discussion. The, the members of this board all certainly have their own opinions about the statue, and uh, I have personally made my own thoughts very clear on this issue. But the important thing here is that decisions about our shared capital are not uh, one person's decision to make, and they shouldn't be, because that's not just uh, the Columbus statue discussion uh, that the work is, is you know, focused on here. It is so much larger than that. It's about imagining our capital in 10, 20, or 150 years. It's about envisioning a process for the CAP board to hear directly from Minnesotans about what the building and surrounding grounds can and should look like to reflect uh, the people it seeks to represent. We are committed to hearing from all Minnesotans in our efforts to build a capital that is truly the people's house. Which is why the work of this task force is so important and why I have immense gratitude for all of you being willing to play this critical role in serving on this task force. Each of you represent a different perspective, a different voice, and a different background. This includes members of the public, representatives of the CAP board, and elected officials and public servants from across the state. And I think that this, this room, this virtual room or this virtual table looks like Minnesota, which is really important because over the coming months, we will hear from one another about what makes the Capitol such an important and meaningful place to us and to so many Minnesotans. And we're gonna spend time getting into the details. And some of the most important decisions uh, come down to the details. As we review the policies that the CAP board and the historical society use to make decisions about the Capitol grounds and the interior of the building, I also you know, encourage us uh, to think about how these decisions impact Minnesotans. Are there opportunities, for example, for the public to weigh in during the process? How are the different perspectives acknowledged in the process that the CAP board will use to make the, the decisions? And what do the, the terms consensus, understanding, and public enjoyment mean in this context? And how do we provide the CAP board with a clear set of recommendations for potential changes to existing policies or with potential draft language for entirely new policies? These are just a few of the many questions I'm looking forward to discussing with all of you as we provide guidance to the CAP board on its policies for monuments, memorials, and works of art on the Capitol grounds and in the building itself. The conversations we have to look forward to will be uh, thought provoking, I think, uh, hopefully exciting and meaningful. And if we do our work well, uh, Minnesotans will be better off for it. I'm excited to have the, the conversation and I'm grateful to each and every one of you for your commitment to the work. Thank you so much for stepping up. And I'm especially grateful to Dr. Gwen Westerman, who has stepped up to serve as the chair of this advisory task force. For those of you who don't know her, um, and you will uh, get to know her very well soon, uh, Dr. Westerman is the Director of the Humanities Program at Minnesota State University Mankato and a professor of English there. She is an award-winning author, essayist, and poet whose work has focused on the Dakota and Native American history. In 2016, Dr. Westerman received a National Endowment for the Humanities grant for her work translating a series of letters written by Dakota people living in Minnesota in, mid, in the mid-19th century. That work is titled, This is Who We Are, Letters from the Dakota, 1838 to 1878. She is also a textile artist whose work, including quilts, has won awards at shows across the country. Her work is included in permanent collections at the Red Cloud Heritage Center Museum in Pine Ridge and the Great Plains Art Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska, and the Minnesota Historical Society in St. Paul. Dr. Westerman is a reflective, insightful, and collaborative leader whose experience and perspective on history and narrative will serve us all well as we embark on this work. I'm excited uh, to work with all of you under her guidance in the coming months and I will just say on a personal note, um, her leadership and mentorship and expertise has served me uh, during my time uh, in, in this office, uh, but just generally as a, as a Native woman, I oftentimes look to, uh, to her and her words 
Um, and my favorite poem that was ever written uh, was written by Dr. Gwen Westerman and hangs uh, on the wall in my office. So I am grateful that she has stepped up to chair uh, the task force. Um, and Chair Westerman, I will turn it over to you now. Chi mm. um, uh, a citizen, an artist, and um, somebody who believes in that overwhelming, overarching idea that the Capitol is the people's house. Um, I served on the Capitol uh, Historic Arts Subcommittee during the renovation of the state capitol. And um, that was one of the most uh, rewarding and challenging experiences that I have ever uh, encountered. Uh, but to see how the space re-energized with, with the uh, renovation um, and how people across the state were interested in seeing themselves reflected in that space uh, meant a lot to our committee and meant uh, a lot to me personally as well. Um, I am a technical writer by trade and um, I was a proofreader at a newspaper um, I was an associate editor for a clinical magazine called Veterinary Medicine for the Small Animal Clinician, where I edited um, articles on mammary tumors in rats, hydrocephaly in a cat. Um, there was even one about how to repair a spine in a snake, and that was not my favorite article to read. Um, I went on to work in financial services as a technical communicator and developing policies and manuals and procedures, um, corporate rollouts, um, the, the front-facing part of the business uh, where our customers and our clients interacted uh, with the services that we provided. Um, I've even worked with the School Sisters of Notre Dame uh, developing a recruiting campaign uh, to um, encourage uh, young women to consider a religious life. Um, right now I teach technical communication at Minnesota State University and that's one of the reasons I was interested in this particular process, uh, task force and that's how do we make good instructions? How do we create good policy, well-written policy that people can follow and uh, is clear? So uh, the Lieutenant Governor talked about the key gaps that are in the current procedures, and I'm really looking forward to working with all of you uh, as we, we move forward. And so we have an introduction exercise, and I will turn it back over to the Lieutenant Governor to facilitate that part of our um, meeting today. And here we go. And sorry, this is Eric here. If we, I could just jump in quickly. Dr. Jolie, if you'd be able, and I think maybe we, or this may be even addressing itself here. We had someone inadvertently sharing their screen, but I, I, think, we're, I think we're all fixed. Lieutenant Governor, if you want to proceed. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. West Westerman. We're excited to, to work with you on this task force. Um, and uh, as, now I have my pictures. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, it's a it's a, an exciting group of people also on on this call today. Uh, and it's important as we prepare for the work of ha ahead that we get to know each other uh, a bit and, and have the chance to develop relationships with other members of the task force, even though we're doing so uh, so virtually. So I'd like us to take a few minutes uh, just to, to introduce ourselves. And um, don't worry, there's no like trust falls or uh, <laughs> you know, any icebreakers that that may make you uncomfortable. Um, we uh, are just want to you know introduce ourselves uh, in a way that I think can ground us um, in in the work. Uh, and I will I'll go first so that I don't um, put anybody on on the spot. So I'd like us to share our name, one or two sentences on our, our personal or professional background as relevant to the, the work uh, of this committee. 
and then uh, respond to a brief prompt that I will uh, give you in a moment. Uh, after I go, Dr. Westerman will introduce herself and share her answer to the prompt, and then we'll go through the list of uh, members in alphabetical order by last name. So that means that Jason, you are on deck after Dr. Westerman and and I go, and I will continue. I will continue prompting. You don't have to, you know, take a look at everybody's last name and figure out who uh, who goes next. So so don't worry about that. I will I will lead you through this. Um, so I'll read it uh, so that folks have a, a chance here to, to think about it. Um, so share a, a personal story that was formative in your perspective on public art or commemorative works. How did this experience inform your values uh, on the topic? So uh, share a personal story that was formative in your perspective on public art or commemorative works. How did this experience inform your values on the topic? So I can start with my own introduction and response, and I'll try to keep it under two minutes so we can hear from everyone over the next 30 minutes. Although for a little squishy, that's that's okay. Uh, that's okay too. Um, so uh, my name is uh, Peggy Flanagan. Um, I am uh, the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Minnesota. I am a member of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe enrolled at uh, the White Earth Reservation. Um, and uh, I'm a recovering legislator and executive director of Children's Defense Fund, uh, Minnesota, and spent a decade uh, working at Wellstone Action, running the Native American Leadership Program uh, there. Um, so the the piece of, uh, of art or sort of this experience that was formative to me um, was uh, the Hearts of Our People exhibit at the, the Minneapolis Institute of, of Art, uh, which was curated um, all by Native women. Uh, it was a couple of years ago that I had the opportunity to go through this exhibit, and I went through it twice. The first time I went through it with, uh, with Governor Walls, and that was uh, really fun. Um, and the second time, uh, I went through with my daughter, and I saw it uh, through her eyes. Um, as we, we walked through the exhibit, uh, she paid very close attention and asked a lot of questions. And then we got to the last room where there was a shadow box um, that was projecting images uh, in black and white on the walls. And I asked her, I said, so what did you think? And you know, she said, uh, I liked it because it made me feel close to my grandmother, even though I've never met her before. And that to me, um, out of the mouths of babes, uh, our young people teach us things every single day. Uh, that is the power of art. Um, and I think uh, that that is the, the spirit that I am bringing into this space, that uh, a little girl um, could connect with uh, her ancestor that she never met before. Um, so uh, with that, uh, Dr. Westerman, I'll turn it over to you. And then Jason, you are on deck, followed by Dana. And as a reminder, let's you can try to keep the intros under and reflections under two minutes. Um, but I'm a process leader, so see if you need a little more time, that's okay with me. <laughs> All right. So Jason, please turn on your, your camera if you can, and, and then uh, go right ahead. Dr. Westerman, sorry, and then Jason. That's, All right. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> My name is Gwen Westerman. Uh, I am Sisi Tuan Wakpe Tuan Dakota, and um, I've had, uh, like I said earlier, experience on the Capital Art Restoration uh, Committee. Uh, that opened my eyes to a lot of um, the intricacies and the detail planning that go into a process like restoring the capital. Um, and um, I think my perspective on public art or commemorative art was formed rather early in my life. Um, in high school, I worked at the Mid-America All Indian Center in Wichita, Kansas. I was just a, a student worker who made copies and typed copies of letters. Um, but during that time, um, 
there was a public monument placed at the confluence of the Little Arkansas and Big Arkansas rivers in Wichita. And it was called the Keeper of the Plains. It was created by Black Bear Boson, who's a Comanche Kiowa uh, artist. And it was a very modernist type of, of um, statue, um, very large. Uh, quite angular, you know, not the smooth shapes of a human form. But the Keeper of the Plains was made with weathering steel and was designed to represent the community of all Indigenous people um, and the confluence of all the people in the communities uh, at the confluence of those two rivers. And there was a lot of pushback um, against that because it was modern. It wasn't uh, typical or stereotypical um, imagery of a Native American or a Plains, uh, Plains Indian. And I didn't understand at that time why people were so upset with it. Um, and then as it started to weather, it began to rust and it took on this really awesome uh, bronze hue. And then people complained that it was rusting, uh, that shouldn't somebody go out there and clean it. And it made me understand that not everybody sees art the same way that I see art. Um, and um, I had to learn to listen, even at 17 and at 18 to other people in the community and understand that not everybody saw the world the way that I saw it. Thank you. Thank you. Jason, now you're up. <laughs> and uh, Dana, you're on deck. Good morning. Can everyone see me? My camera is on. Great. Good morning, I'm Jason Adkins. I'm executive director of the Minnesota Catholic Conference. We're the public policy voice of the Catholic Church in Minnesota. Uh, I'm an attorney by training. I also spend a fair amount of time at the University of St. Thomas, where I'm currently serving as a visiting scholar at the seminary, and I also teach at the law school as well. I'm sitting in front of pictures of John Ireland and various renditions of both our cathedrals in Minnesota and also our state capitol building. So uh, love the opportunity to be a part of conversation. I was formed in terms of public art by my year living in Rome, where you can't help when you walk the streets every day, uh, seeing the way in which architecture cultivates both memory and identity. So whether it was the ancient Romans and the way in which they built a city to cultivate a certain public philosophy and a certain public uh, virtue and an idea of citizenship, um, so too the uh, popes created a, a city with a spiritual geography, uh, the pilgrimage routes and everything like that from the great colonnades and bridges of Bernini uh, to the opened arms of St. Peter's Square and the Basilica, you really see the importance of uh, public art in uh, cultivating, as I said, memory and identity. It's a very formative experience for me and glad to be part of this conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Jason. So uh, Dana, you are up and then uh, Dr. Bean, you are on deck. Thank you. I'm Dana Badgerow. Uh, I served as Commissioner of Administration in two administrations under um, Governor Carlson and again under Governor Pawlenty. Um, I, I was also privileged to serve as a public member of the Capital Renovation Commission. The Capital Renovation itself actually started as a germ of an idea under the Pawlenty administration with Department of Administration's leadership and the Cap Board's leadership. So um, I, it was a long process, believe me, and it, it was so wonderful to see it come to fruition. Uh, my exposure to public art is kind of twofold. First of all, I was very, very um, impressed with the work that was done by the Art Subcommittee of the Renovation Commission and was also felt very strongly that the paintings in the governor's reception area needed to be removed for their symbolic reasons. But my real exposure to public art occurred my very first day as admin commissioner under Carlson when um, a painting arrived in my office. Uh, it was a large framed picture. Uh, I unwrapped it and lo and behold found a photograph, a, a nice photograph, but only a photograph of Governor Perpich and his wife. So the rules became very, very important. And I think that's why they're important to us here, because the rules said two things. First, it had to be a painting, not a photograph, and it could be of the governor himself. 
So I had the dubious distinction of having to decline hanging of Governor Perpich's portrait in the state capitol, which led to an article in the National Enquirer, the only time I've been quoted in the National Enquirer, but also led the Perpiches to take out a billboard on University Avenue, which said they will not let us in the capitol. So we adhere to the rules, whether rightly or wrongly, whether the, per the portrait, one of the arguments Governor Perpich used was that al Key had his horse in his picture. So it was not inappropriate for him to have Lola in his. Okay, that's my, <laughs> that's how I'm informed. I'm informed by the fact that the rules are really, really important. And I think that we should set those rules and I'm privileged to be a part of the committee. Dana, thank you. What an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Bean, uh, you are up with uh, State Auditor Blaha on deck. Hi, um, Kate Bean, I'm uh, Hello, my relatives. My name is Dr. Kate Bean. I am a former, uh, well, I'm a citizen of the Flandreau Santee Sioux Nation and also uh, Muscogee Creek as well. And I'm a former Dartmouth, Charles Eastman Dartmouth Fellow from Dartmouth College, as well as a president's postdoc from UC Santa Cruz. Today I serve as director of Native American Initiatives at the Minnesota Historical Society. And I also teach sometimes at Minneapolis College um, in my spare time. <laughs> um, and I am the mother of two little, very passionate and brave girls who help me to see the world in new ways or in sometimes old ways that I've forgotten. Um, and I guess my story of, of sort of how my perspective has been has been affected or impacted is um, the, some of the work that my family actually helped to advocate for the uh, public art on the southeast corner of Bede Makaska. Um, and that, that public art project was um, and continues to be uh, an ongoing process to, to better acknowledge and represent our community and our family that lived at this space. And one of the first times I, I took my daughter, uh, my, my children there, one of my daughters um, went up and she saw the stampings in the ground. And, and in the ground they have, there are these stampings with some Dakota language in them. Um, and they're really, they're really child friendly. They're, they they um, show images and they show our language. And she saw the word champa, and which means choke cherry. And our grandmother was champa dutoin choke cherry woman, and she lived at this lake. And that's also my niece's name. And so she saw her cousin's name, and she saw her language in the in the pavement um, at the lake. And she said, "Look, mom, our they have they have Dakota here at our lake." we're here. And I think for me to see my daughter see herself and her family represented there, which was so different than 15 years earlier when I first walked around that lake and didn't see us at all. Um, just seeing the way that that she um, felt like she belonged and that, that welcoming um, feeling for her as a child at a place that was so important to the history of our, our family. Um, for me, that made a world of difference. So be down, Maya. Thank you. Uh, State Auditor uh, Julie Blaha and Lindsay, you are on deck. State Auditor. Oh, hello. I'm so glad to be here. Uh, again, I'm Julie Blaha, your State Auditor. Um, before this role, I uh, was a math teacher. I was a treasurer uh, in the labor movement and a labor leader. And uh, I think a lot of people, not something a lot of people know, but I also worked for four seasons at the Oliver H. Kelly Farm, which is part of the Minnesota Historical Society up in Elk River. So uh, I am I am I'm also a math nerd, but I do have a healthy dose of history nerd in me as well. Uh, I think one of the, the moments that I really appreciated um, art um, especially with the historical flavor to it, was uh, when I was treasurer of the AFL-CIO. I was having one of those days, and I'm sure there are people on this call who've had these days, when people aren't returning your calls, you're not getting through it. It was just a, just a rough day. Um, and particularly in, in trying to deal with, uh, it was during a legislative session. It just wasn't getting anything done. So I stopped, I went to take a walk, and I remember looking at the Capitol thinking, wow, I don't know if I belong here. You know, it just felt cold and had those kind of rough moments. And then I went over to the workers' memorial garden area. And it was, I had this moment where I could go and I could find the teacher in that memorial. There's a teacher in there. And and finding the uh, the kind of the labor activist that's in there. And of course, I always go and check and look at the, the representation of Prince in there, which if you don't know what's in there, let 
I'll, I'll show you next time you go look at it. But it was this, this moment of like, I do belong here. I am here. I am literally part of these grounds. This is my house. And it was really um, helpful to see myself represented in a, in a very real and very permanent way. Uh, on the Capitol grounds. Um, so representation is a really important thing to me when I look at the art that we have around there. Thank you. Thank you so much, State Auditor. I'm really grateful that you are, are part of this, this process with all of us. Um, Lindsay, uh, you're up with Jessica on deck. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. Wonderful. Um, thank you. I am so honored to be part of this task force. Um, I'm Lindsay Dyer, and I am currently uh, working for a design research collective. I do uh, human-centered design experiences for corporate clients. Um, that makes me sound very corporate now, but it wasn't always that way. Um, I've spent three years at the Historical Society and the Historic Sites and Museums Division, rest in peace. Um, and then also after that, I was the uh, library director at the James J. Hill Center in downtown St. Paul. Um, I have a, my master's in library science and I'm also a certified archivist. And so um, I've had some time um, developing policies for public spaces, working with art museums, and in fact, I still work with the Hill Center um, and their art and collections there today. Um, I currently serve on the State Historic Preservation Office Review Board, um, and I, um, Dr. Westerman, I love uh, your textile artist. I also do that in my spare time as well. Um, and then also for the Dakota Iyapi speakers out there, I learned that um, Minnesota wounds by Wukatuya. Um, so Dakota Yapi Kitna. Thank you. So, uh, wow, that's a big question to ask about um, the impact. Um, I have to say currently my most recent um, influence has been all of the art that has poured out of the community this past year um, for George Floyd um, living in the cities. It's everywhere and I can't, you know, go down the street without seeing it. And that has been very transformative to me in a way that, um, you know, when people feel like they have no voice, uh, um, art comes out, art just bleeds out of them and, and you see it everywhere. And so I feel like it's, it has such a powerful voice. And um, well, that's not my, you know, childhood memory of art. It is the most recent and I'd like to share that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Uh, Jessica, you are up with uh, Dr. Jolie on, on deck. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. My name is Jessica Intermill. I um, am an attorney in Minneapolis and I've practiced Indian law, federal Indian law for about 15 years, principally representing tribes. Um, in that work, one of the really poignant themes that has come through is uh, there's a quote from Faulkner that the past is never dead, it's not even past. And that is something that I live in my work every day. Um, the other thing that I live in my work is the recognition that I am not an Indian in Indian country. Um, I'm a Jewish white girl from Nebraska, which gave me the experience of both knowing what it is to be on the inside and to be on the outside. And so I take that with me um, both in my work and in, um, in my work raising my eight-year-old distance learner who's hanging out in the other room right now. The, the public art experience that um, keeps popping into my head right now is that when I was in college, I went to, um, went to Japan and, and some other countries as part of a study abroad and had the privilege to go to the Hiroshima Memorial. And they did an amazing job there of really capturing various parts of a really, really awful event so that you had the um, Sadako Memorial, which is just a soaring memorial, um, all of the sort of the, the curved lines that uh, Dr. Westerman talked about, that, that the, the statue that she talked about was not, it is. Um, but at the same time, there was a hollowed out uh, building that had been a bank that was burnt out and they left it as it was after the explosion. Um, and it, it became a really important converse, or a really important um, discussion of how there can be art that is historical, but it is not history. Because at the same time that those memorials were happening, there was also a stairway that was covered with paper cranes 
that people had made and brought, and they were having a conversation with the past. And I think that's really what the best public art does. So, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jessica. Dr. Jolly. Oh, thank you. Osio dohitsu. My name is Eric Jolly. Um, I'm currently the president of the St. Paul in Minnesota Foundation. Uh, some of you, uh, in which case, uh, one of the perspectives that we're bringing to this wonderful meeting is uh, the study of narrative change. Who owns the narrative? What narratives are incomplete? What narratives are simply untrue? Uh, what narratives are missing? Before that, I was the president and CEO of the St. Paul and of the Science Museum in Minnesota. Uh, and so uh, there we launched the world's first exhibit on race um, and, and understood a lot about how we represent ourselves and the other. Um, and that was a great time as in the museum world. I worked a lot on the issues of exhibits and, and the notion of um, what's a permanent collection and what's a permanent exhibit. Uh, I've also served as uh, Obama's representative to the Institute of Museum and Library Services. I did a board terms at the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, when I'm happy to say as an artist, I too am in the Great Plains Museum. And so I weave in my Cherokee tradition, uh, traditional baskets. Uh, I am in the permanent collection also of the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, and uh, so I had a small type, time in my life where I thought I would be an artist. And then I had a longer time when I thought I should be a homeowner. And so I uh, became a professor. I've been a professor of mathematics, a professor of cognitive science. I have a background in mathematics, physics, and cognitive psychology. Uh, for purposes of this, I'm also uh, just recently finished my service on the justice circle for the Michael Forcia case. And, uh, and that that changes my view of what is my most impactful public art. I I don't know what the answer to that would be, uh, Lieutenant Governor. I, I remember as a youth going by the Teddy Roosevelt statue on the uh, steps of the uh, American Museum of Natural History. And as a kid, we'd all sneak up and look at the scrotum of the horse because every Columbus Day, AIM would spray paint the horse red and they could never get out that crack of red. And that was my tour, first moment as an art tour guide uh, for all of my friends. Um, I think more recently I worked with um, St. Regis Mohawk artist Linda Enfuso and we were doing a public display uh, which was a sand painting outdoors. And then we spent hours telling stories to the those who had gathered and assembled to watch. And as we walked through, around telling our stories, the art that we had spent half the day constructing was obliterated. And we talked about the notion of permanence and impermanence in your heart not in the exhibit. And uh, I think that's something that I want to bring to this is our, our notion of permanence uh, our, and our, our notion of, of uh, as I recall that art today, I know in my heart it is different than what I saw those many years ago. And it is more rich and more meaningful and more applicable to my life as I remember it than as I may have seen it. And so I wanted to talk about those permanence things. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jolly. Um, uh, so we've got uh, Jennifer up next with uh, Tish on deck. Jennifer. Uh, yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer Jones. Um, I, my current position, I'm the Associate Executive Director of the Minnesota Historical Society. Um, I've been there for 16 years. 
And prior to that, I worked at Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, so I've spent 30 years uh, working in uh, public history and cultural heritage, uh, primarily in areas of collections uh, and library work. Um, I have quite a bit of experience as well with the uh, the capital renovation um, uh, during um, uh, that that. Uh, renovation. Uh, I was the point person at the Minnesota Historical Society for the work that we did on um, the governor's uh, uh, reception room paintings uh, and a couple of others. I uh, worked closely with our uh, Department of Native American Initiatives uh, as as we we followed uh, the recommendations, removed those from the, the from the reception room and into that third floor space to add more context to them. Um, I think my uh, I've also worked uh, quite extensively with our own executive uh, council where we've done work on uh, clarifying uh, our responsibilities that we share with CAP board uh, on spaces within the historical society. And hopefully that's that's some uh, perspective that will help uh, as we have these conversations. Um, I was reflecting on uh, what what experience I've had with public art that that, that really was a was a deeply emotional experience for me. And there's no question that I felt that the work that I did uh, with with the capital renovation was, you know, part of a personal journey. Uh, I learned so much about how people see themselves and how how you can look at these things for additional lens. but but I, I thought I would go back and talk about an experience I had very early uh, in in my adult life when I visited um, Washington D.C. on a on a on a Thanksgiving morning with some friends, and it was a really cool misty day, and we visited the Korean War Memorial, and that is that experience has always stuck with me because of. Um, just the the very visceral experience of walking through that memorial and 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 watching people and seeing first of all how effective it was um, in that that very misty morning. If anybody's been there, it's 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 sculpture and it's a memory wall. And on a misty morning, it almost had a had a ghostly experience. And and so it had a very much a, uh, a, a it was a very experiential thing, but it was also a very emotional thing because there were families there and there were people by that wall that, that memory wall whose 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 fathers and grandfathers had fought in that war, and it, it's always resonated with me about how how strong how strongly people relate to public monuments and memorials and art uh, and in both positive ways that that, that was that was a very cathartic experience for a lot of people but then in just you know terrible negative ways and and the way people have been, have been, have, been uh, have seen those things as being uh, exclusive to them and we've seen a lot of that over the course of the summer of course across the country so I think that was the one that uh, I thought really encapsulated how I feel about it thanks Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. Uh, Tish, you are up with uh, Representative Lee on deck. Peace. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Tish Jones, and I am a poet. I'm also uh, the founder and executive director of an arts and culture-based nonprofit here in the Twin Cities called True Art Speaks. I have a background organizing international um, arts uh, arts events, um, specifically related to young people. Um, I am a cultural and narrative strategist, also a cultural producer. And I think um, my personal story, I think when I think about the most formative experience is also recent um, with specifically with the really, really popularized um, memorial um, that was made for George Floyd on the side of the Cup Foods building. Um, I ended up in a few public and private conversations about how that mural came to be and in the context of like how did it um, impact my values around around public art com commemorative works just thinking about process um, that thinking about you know that specific site and its relationship and history um, as it relates to sort of black folks in that area, how black folks feel that they've been treated by that particular institution, um, thinking about, you know, a larger context in that area in terms of a food desert, so that being one of the only places that black folks could frequent to get the resources that they need or the sustenance that they need, while also not feeling treated well, and the mural 
not having been um, created by black folks. Um, not having also consulted with black folks about whether or not that mural um, was something that on that particular site would, would feel sort of honoring. Um, and the, the conversations that happen afterwards, so really thinking about, you know, what does the process look like when you're creating commemorative works? Who should be a part of what conversations? Like, how do you go about that? Um, you know, intent versus impact and things like that. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you uh, for that, and this conversation is very timely. Uh, Representative Lee uh, is next. Um, Senator Nelson would be on deck, but she isn't able to uh, join us today. So then we'll go to Commissioner Roberts Davis. So Representative Lee. Thank you, uh, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan, and I will uh, try to follow the lead of my good friend Eric Anderson from Department of Administration and turning my video on for my speaking portion. Uh, Hello, everyone. I represent Fu Lee. I represent District 59A in North Minneapolis. And uh, for me, with regards to public arts, um, my background is not in the arts, and so I'm glad to be around uh, folks with so much uh, and so many knowledge. Uh, for me, I, I think one important uh, piece that really stands out for me is uh, the Hmong Memorial on the Capitol Mall. Uh, this is really significant to not just only the Hmong. Uh, community here in Minnesota, but uh, throughout uh, the country, knowing that when folks come to visit St. Paul or visit Minnesota, they have to stop by uh, to visit, you know, what we have in place and knowing that and understanding that, you know, even within uh, the community, the Hmong community here and other Southeast Asian communities uh, here in the state of Minnesota who was part of the secret war effort that, you know, that don't really, the peace that we have right now, uh, people disagree or agree that, you know, there may there needs to be more uh, share about the experiences of other uh, community groups that participated in that. And so I just feel like, you know, it's an honor to to be on here and really hear the different stories that we have of folks from throughout, uh, you know, the state of Minnesota, you know, from across the country coming in to share their experience and really take in what we have been able to do here in Minnesota and uh, hope uh, some of the stuff that we can do in the future. And so just want to say thank you again, Lieutenant Governor, for having me on this task force. Thank you so much, Representative. Uh, so we've got uh, Commissioner Roberts Davis with Daniel on deck. Good morning, everyone. I'm Alice Roberts Davis. I'm the commissioner for the Minnesota Department of Administration. Uh, in terms of my background, I have a background in law. Um, I'm, a set, like I said, the commissioner for administration, which makes me the de facto landlord for the Capitol building. Um, prior to being the commissioner, I was the assistant commissioner for this agency. And prior to that, I spent 13 years at Target Corporation, where I had a number of different roles, including real estate, which fun fact about real estate there, they have a massive, very impressive art collection, which is actually run out of their real estate department. And so a lot of exposure to art through my role there in real estate. Um, in my current role, though, uh, one of the most formative things that I had the opportunity to do was sit not as a decision maker, but just kind of more as a fly on the wall uh, with the uh, Capital Art Subcommittee a few years back and listen to the conversations that we had about how art should be addressed in the Capitol during the restoration of that building. And uh, hearing the different perspectives about how art should be placed in the Capitol, particularly as we talked about the governor's reception room and the ante room, and um, specifically the conversations about privilege of placement and what it meant for what types of art should be in those rooms and how it should be um, interpreted if it were going to be in those rooms was really important. Uh, getting out into different communities and having those conversations with the public about uh, what was important to them and how they viewed what should be in our capital was really enlightening for me. And so I really look forward to being a part of this group and having those conversations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. And last but not least, uh, Daniel. Good morning, Lieutenant Governor and Task Force members. Uh, my name is Daniel Yang. I serve as Senior Advisor to St. Paul Mayor Melvin Carter. 
Uh, you are not seeing my video uh, because my laptop camera gave up a, a few weeks ago, um, but I uh, appreciate seeing everybody else's faces. Um, also serve uh, as one of the newest members uh, on the CAP board. I think I have one meeting under my belt, so um, really excited about uh, diving in into this work. Uh, a personal story around uh, uh, public art is 10 years ago um, after graduating college, I, I headed down to Venezuela for about six months um, and did some work with their Ministry of Popular Power for Indigenous Peoples. Um, it was a brand new ministry that, that they built up and one of the first things that they took a look at um, was around representation of indigenous folks in both education, but um, in public spaces, um, uh, the language that they use, but um, also with, with uh, they have a, a, a rich um, system of, of public um, art with murals and, and statues and other commemorative works. And so for the first time, uh, many of those folks, uh, indigenous people were actually involved in the conversations around what and how they were represented. And so it's a, a uh, at least one component of what we'll be looking at um, a, a pretty similar um, uh, discussion. So excited about the work ahead and, and appreciate uh, the opportunity to serve on this task force with you all. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I know we went a little over, but I also think that it's important for us to uh, be grounded uh, as we begin this really important work, um, but also learn a little bit more uh, about each other as we'll be having uh, these conversations. And I certainly lifted up a story that was was very moving, um, you know, at the at the beginning, and and many of you did the same. Um, but I also don't want to shy away from the fact that I certainly have had lots of things to say about uh, the artwork uh, inside the Capitol and, and how stories are told and, and who decides how those stories are told. Um, and uh, to be very candid, specifically uh, requested that I didn't have to see the carving uh, in, the, uh, in the house um, uh, each, each day when I, I walked in uh, based on where I was seated. And so these things impact us and affect us. And I think that this is absolutely uh, the right team uh, to uh, help us to go through uh, this process, which is um, uh, emotional. Uh, and uh, just uh, as just to reflect for a moment on on uh, the comments that, that Tish shared with us, just so incredibly uh, timely um, that, that these, these uh, conversations are, are long overdue. Um, and as someone who has expressed uh, feelings around uh, making sure that everyone feels seen and heard and valued when they uh, go to the Capitol, whether or not uh, they, they have ever been, um, uh, this is uh, an opportunity to, to sort of uh, actually do the work, um, not just talk about it, but, but do the work in, in partnership with, with all of you. So I'm really under, honored and humbled to be at this table. I will not do a, a whole lot more of facilitation and as part of this task force because I also want to be able to participate as a member of this task force, which is why I asked Dr. Westerman uh, to take on uh, to take on this this role. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you so much for your uh, reflections. We are going to have a an agenda that will um, keep us busy, uh, but I, I trust that um, Dr. Westerman will be an appropriate uh, guide for us as we um, venture into into this work together. So Chimi Gutch for all of your um, reflections and Dr. Westerman, I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, we're gonna take just a quick round of introductions from the staff who will be helping us uh, with this process. And um, if they, as I call your name, if you could just briefly describe your role. Uh, Paul Mandel uh, will go first, and then uh, Peter Musty. Hi, good morning. My name is Paul Mandel. I'm executive director, executive secretary for the Capital Area Architectural and Planning Board. Um, I have been here at the Cap Board since uh, for now 33 years. Uh, first as a principal planner and now as exec sec. Hello, okay. my name. Thank you, Chair. My name. My name is Peter Musty. I'm the principal planner uh, for the Cap Cap Board, and uh, I've been here just five years. <laughs> Looking forward to helping um, um, put some of these uh, recommendations into practice. Okay. Linda Spore and then Eric Anderson. 
Hello, thank you. My name is Linda Spohr. I'm a planner here at the CAP board as well. It's a pleasure to be here with. Thank you for your uh, service on this task force. We're looking forward to working with you. Hi, uh, Eric Anderson, Department of Administration. Uh, my normal work is around the legislative and communications for, for admin, and I've been sort of the project manager for, for the task forces here with the CAP board. David Kelleher and then Emmett Hadeen. Thank you, Chair Westerman. David Kelleher, Director of Public Policy for the Minnesota Historical Society. Um, I've been in that role for a number of years or as we measure in legislative sessions or, or dog years. Um, that work brings me to the Capitol nearly every day and um, never uh, fail to have a, a sense of awe and a sense of place with the building. Um, I participated in a lot of the activities of the Capital Preservation Commission and the Capital Arts Subcommittee, um, where we all learned a lot about how people see the space and relate to the space. So um, happy to be here and be a resource to members of the task force. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Emmett Hedin. I'm a policy advisor in the governor and lieutenant governor's office and look forward to supporting all of you in this work. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm so happy that we have, have such a great staff to help support the work that we're going to do. So we really value your, your efforts here on our behalf. Um, we're going to take a short five minute break um, and pick up again at 11.05 with a presentation from Mariah Levinson, the Office of Collaboration and Dispute Resolution.
Thank you, Dr. Westerman. I'm Mariah Levison. I run the Office for Collaboration and Dispute Resolution at the Department of Administration. And my office helps to build consensus on contentious public issues, of which there are very few these days, right? Just kidding. Uh, but resolving contentious issues or um, building consensus often involves a lot of public engagement, uh, always involves public engagement. And so my office also provides uh, guidance and recommendations and resources and training around public engagement and public engagement best practices for both state and local government. So that's why I am here today, since all of you will be making important recommendations about how the CAT board can best engage citizens in Minnesota. Uh, I'm here to provide a little bit of grounding and what some of those best practices are from literature and practice. Uh, so. Our website, which is in the PowerPoint, has a whole list of resources where you can go to see more information. We, you were, uh, Eric also shared with you ahead of the meeting some of our favorite resources. So there were three pillars for public engagement, which uh, is kind of a, a quick snapshot of some guiding principles and best practices beyond the usuals, which is a nice summary of some great public engagement practices. And then there were some other um, handouts that were a little bit more philosophical. The wise collaborator talks about a different paradigm for public engagement and uh, a list of tips from my office. So those resources are available to you. The PowerPoint will also be available to you. I'm going to move through it somewhat quickly, but hopefully um, you all will join me in having some discussion here. So I'm going to ask you to participate with me. So I hope that you will, so I don't just have to talk at you for 30 minutes, which is not good public engagement. So that's my first lesson. Um, so I'm going to ask you some questions and to, to chat some things and to raise your hand. So I hope that you will uh, join in um, along with me. Uh, next slide, Eric. And if you could, um, uh, task force members, if you could keep your cameras on so we can all see each other, um, that will be helpful for our participation. Also, now that we do lots of training around how to do virtual public engagement, that's one of the recommendations that we always make. So thank you, Dr. Westerman. Um, here are just some objectives, but you can go to the next slide, Eric, and continue. Thank you. So what is public engagement? There's lots of definitions, and people talk about community engagement, and public engagement, and civic engagement. There's no one definition, but this is one that the state worked on a number of years ago, and I like the definition because it includes the word meaningful twice, uh, and because it implies a, a two-way street, a dialogue. And too much of the public engagement that happens in government is perfunctory or even done grudgingly. And I think that's because sometimes in the state or local government where we have lots of wonderful expertise on subject areas, we forget to recognize the kind of expertise that the public has, which may be on that technical subject area, whether that's environmental regulation or, or works of art. Uh, but the public always has important expertise around their context and their needs and the needs of their communities. And those are important parts of the puzzle. So again, that, you know, focusing on meaningful engagement uh, is why I, I like this definition. And I think it's one of um, the better ones out there. Next slide. So a couple of reminders of what community engagement is not. It's not a single meeting uh, that happens too often in government. Public engagement really works when it's a sustained relationship between government and the state. So having one meeting uh, doesn't do much for that. Um, it's not a one-way conversation. So again, if good public engagement is about long-term sustained relationships, and not too many people would stay in a relationship where one person does all the talking and all the decision-making. So it's a, it's a two-way street. And government can go too far on either extreme. Too often we're not listening well enough, but there are times that we also don't do a great job helping the public to understand our context and our limitations and barriers so that we can work together collaboratively on problem solving. 
It's not asking for input on a decision that has already been made. It doesn't happen a lot, but if and when it does, it's clearly terrible for trust. Uh, and finally, it's not something that we do only when it's legally required. Folks recognize that, they can feel it. And there are many places in government where we are required to do public engagement, and sometimes that is misinterpreted as the only time we should or could or are allowed to do public engagement. Next slide. So this next piece is about some reminders about why we want to engage. So I'm wondering if one or two people would chime in here and talk about why do you think engagement is important? And you can just jump in or you can raise your hands either way. So we are able to exclusive uh, in, in inclusive perspective, inclusive voices, our voices. Thank you, Lindsay. Other thoughts? I think you get to better decision making when you have that more inclusive process and, and more diverse views. Absolutely. I would just say too that there's an expectation of community input that people expect to be able to be a part of the process in some way. And so if you don't create that forum, at least people are frustrated and feeling like they've been zeroed out and it doesn't give credibility to the ultimate decisions that are made. Great. Anyone else? I think you have more ambassadors out there when people have been part of creating the decision, more people who can talk about why this is the right decision. Great. So those are, I think you all hit on some of the most important reasons. There is a hunger for public engagement. It's only increasing. And our decisions, when public engagement is done well, Folks have to really wrestle with each other's perspectives and needs and concerns. And when we're able to arrive at a decision that incorporates all of that, it's really a decision that's better for more Minnesotans and achieves more of the outcomes that we all want to achieve. Uh, so you really touched on the most important ones. A couple other ones. Um, when we start having discussions early and often, those discussions are often more productive, more civil. When we wait until we just have one public hearing left before a decision making point, folks feel that sense of tension and that they have you know, three minutes at the mic to make their point. And those are not really productive discussions that lead to really wise outcomes. The faster project implementation, that was a piece that the commissioner was getting at. You know, there are there's plenty of examples where task forces or other groups make decisions and then they get stuck in court or back and forth in legislative process and they can't move forward. When civic engagement is done really well, there's that buy-in out there, there are those ambassadors who can go out and explain what the constraints were and how the decision took into account multiple points of view, and then we're able to move forward on the decision that was made. That kind of public engagement where folks really get to learn about each other's needs and concerns builds trust in each other, it helps folks get behind you know, the, the positions or demands that the other side has and to really understand where each other is coming from. So that builds the trust in each other. And when government creates those kind of forums, it builds trust in government as well. Next slide, Eric. Oh, there's one more there. Um, so, uh, thank you. <laughs> so, um, clearly, um, public engagement helps us understand more what's important to folks. Um, and it also provides opportunities for capacity building. So, folks who get involved in public engagement activities are more informed not only about the issue at hand, but also more broadly informed about. Um, how to participate with government, you know, how these meetings work, how decisions are made, and that starts to build skills, knowledge, and leadership in communities to better participate in the future. Uh, and then that more that more support and content, less contentiousness, which we mentioned. Next slide, Eric. So we're going to shift here to talking for a second about what are some of the, the accepted guiding principles or values for public engagement. But before I do that, I want to take a second and ask you to go to the chat and chat out what is a value for you personally that guides your public engagement work or the way that you think about public engagement. So you can take a minute to think about that. But again, um, what you know, one word or one value that really guides what you think is important or how you think about public engagement and why. So if you could put that into the chat for your colleagues to see, that would be great. In the meantime, I'll share what some other folks think are some guiding values. So probably the kind of biggest association around 
public engagement. It's called the International Association for Public Participation. They have great resources on their website. They also have great trainings. And they have a list of core values, which they did a lot of public engagement around to develop. So I'm going to share their list with you. So um, public engagement um, is is grounded in the belief that folks who are impacted have a right to be involved in the decision. Uh, public participation includes the promise that the public's contribution will influence the decision. So that is, of course, one of the most important parts of public engagement is that we don't want to go out and ask folks. Uh, and then not do anything with their input. And I think, in my experience at least, government often is um, trying to incorporate the input that we hear, but it's also very hard to show how we've incorporated that. And so that 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 feedback about how we're using that input is really important. And also doing that really hard work to get a broad swath of folks engaged with us uh, is really one of our biggest challenges because we may incorporate the feedback that we hear from one group that we were able to engage with, but often that group is made up of folks who are sort of technical stakeholders, folks with a part of their jobs or professionals in this area or lobbyists and those kinds of things. So how do we do the hard work of engaging a broad swath of the public and then incorporating their perspective into our decision-making? Public participa uh, participation promotes sustainable decision-making. So we've touched on that. Again, when you have a decision that incorporates the needs and interests of many folks, then it's a decision um, that it's going to be more accepted and able to put into place and to last. Public participation seeks out and facilitates the involvement of those potentially impacted. So again, this is a key part is that um, I would say in my experience doing lots of public engagement work, the harder part is the planning for how we actually get folks to turn out and participate in our engagement activities, whether those are public meetings or surveys or focus groups. Those are um, quite a bit of work to do well, um, but it's even more work to build relationships with community organizations and partners to make sure that we're engaging lots of folks in, in those community engagement activities. Next slide. Public participation seeks input from participants in designing how they participate. So to some degree, that's a part of why you all are here and why the task force on public engagement has been created. Um, but if we design public participation without involving the public in that design, then it's not as likely to work for them. So that's one of my uh, best practice tips too when I'm doing engagement work and helping state agencies design engagement work is to set up a committee of, who are representative of the folks that we want to engage to help us do that planning. Public participation provides participants with the information that they need. It's a trickier thing than it sounds like. Folks do need uh, information and able to, in order to be able to weigh in in a meaningful way, um, but lecturing at folks for a long time is not a great way to deliver that information. So how do we have handouts? How do we have engaging presentations? How do we work creatively to get folks the information that they need so that they can engage in a meaningful way? And again, uh, communicating back how their input has affected the decision, which takes a substantial strategy and multiple approaches to, to do well. Next slide. And this is another organization, the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation. I won't go over each of these, but these are another set uh, of core principles to help us think about public engagement. Um, they touch on many of the same principles uh, that we just went over and you can find them in your materials. I'm just gonna up your chat here for a minute and reflect on some of your core values. So we have avoiding insularity, equitable representation, bottom up, common good, respectful, openness, empathy, centering those most impacted, integrity, empathy again. So let me pause here and ask for questions or reflections or thoughts about uh, anything that we've covered so far, in particular guiding principles or values for engagement. All right, we'll jump in at any time, but seeing none, if you could move to the next slide, Eric. So this chart, if I could leave you with one thing, it might be this, and this tool comes from um, the International Association for Public Participation again. And what it says is that there are a number of reasons that government engages the public. 
to inform, which is, you know, to let folks know we're going to be doing work on the street outside of your house. You're not going to be able to get in and out of your driveway for the next couple of days to consult. Let's have a discussion. We're going to be doing work on the street in front of your house sometime this year. What would be the best time to do that? To involve, you know, is to do something more like what you're doing here with this task force to really um, bring the public in and have, have them have, you know, much more input and decision making power. And to collaborate is really to work together to, to develop an outcome. Uh, and so that might take the form of a task force like this, a committee. Um, some units of government have ongoing advisory committees. Uh, and the, the far end of the spectrum, Empower, is about the times in which government really says, if a group can you know, reach consensus or find a path forward on, on this particular item, we'll take that and we'll move forward with it. Um, so not super common, but it does happen. And the important message of this spectrum here is not that Empower is, is better than Inform. All of these purposes are important. They all have their place and the public appreciates all of them. What's important is for government to communicate really clearly what the purpose of any public engagement activity is. And it's not an easy thing to do. So thinking about right from the beginning, if there's some kind of a planning team um, in invitation materials and reminders at the beginning of the meeting, throughout the meeting, really helping the public understand uh, what we're asking them for at this time goes really far in helping government get the information that will be useful to us and helping the public be satisfied with the experience that they've had in the engagement. Next slide, Eric. So these are some of the purposes for engagement. And again, depending on what your purpose is, you wanna be thinking about them, whether what you're trying to do is inform or collaborate or empower. Um, so there are lots of different reasons that we can be doing engagement, um, but it's important to stop and reflect on what's our purpose, what are we trying to accomplish, and then where on that IAP2 spectrum are we and how do we plan according to our purposes and our goals. Uh, it happens more than maybe I would like to admit that I get called in to help design a public engagement activity and I say, well, what's your goal or your purpose? And folks say, um... We're not sure. Um, so just um, we know that we need to engage and that's a good thing. It's a good thing that we are engaging, but we need to take the time to get really clear on that purpose uh, and what it is that we're asking for the public from the public. Next slide. So before I touch on a couple of best practices, again, any questions or reflections on those purposes for engagement or anything that we've covered yet? Right, so we have one more section on best practices and they overlap quite a bit with the guiding principles and the reasons for engaging. Um, but again, we're sharing these with you today uh, to help you think through what does really good public engagement look like so you can think about advising the CAT board on what practices and policies it could undertake to engage the public in a way that's informed by best practices. So this list comes from uh, an organization called the Institute for Local Government. While they're focused on local government, they have great public engagement resources uh, and that they're in your handout. Um, but I am gonna go through a list from my office in a little bit more depth there. If you can go to the next slide. So um, the thing that I would um, emphasize the most along with that know your purpose and plan accordingly is uh, relationship building is first and remains at the center. So when public engagement works really well, um, it's a two-way street, it's a relationship. Um, we need to not be waiting till there's a decision to be made or a difficult issue to work through and then be calling people together. We do need to call people together at those times, but we need to be in sustained dialogue with folks about what they need so that as government, we can be uh, planning and designing and developing programs that meet the needs of those that we're trying to serve. Another reason that relationship building comes first and remains at the center is the piece that I talked about earlier that turnout is one of the biggest challenges that we face in government around public engagement. We can put a lot of effort into creating a big public meeting and then maybe get 50 people and those are the same 50 people who are already talking to who know how to reach us because they are uh, you know, a technical stakeholder who this is a part of their day job to be working with the state around this decision. They're a lobbyist. Not that those folks' perspectives aren't important, 
but it takes quite a bit of effort to really, you know, engage just folks from across our state who might be interested in this topic. And so having these sustained relationships enables us to partner with those folks to turn people out to the public engagement activities that the state is putting on. So know your purpose and design accordingly. That's the piece that we talked about, again, about knowing, are we really letting the public know that we're undertaking the process to review what art is in the Capitol and we just want them to know that's happening right now? Uh, are we asking them to come out and share their input on you know, what art should be at the Capitol? Are we asking them to sit down in a sustained way with us to collaborate and develop a long-term vision? Uh, so knowing what we're trying to do and then thinking about what methods would get us there. So is that, again, is it partnerships with organizations? Is it surveys? Is it focus groups? Is it public meetings? Is it ongoing advisory groups? So what methods would we use to engage with the public depending on what we're trying to accomplish? And then plan, plan, plan. So um, to do public engagement well just takes a lot of planning. And when we do all that planning, we can get really useful information, really satisfactory exper you know, experiences for both the public who participate and the decision makers who are hoping to learn something from those activities. But it takes a lot of planning to figure out how can we provide that background information in a way that will inform participants so that they can participate in a meaningful way without overwhelming them with kind of wonky long background information. So way too often uh, at the state, we will have a technical expert come up and give too long of a presentation that doesn't use plain language, uses a PowerPoint and just isn't very engaging. So I recently did a big public meeting. The commissioner was there, I think, so she can weigh in on how it worked, but we limited our presenters to three PowerPoint slides. They were able to use one picture, um, one graphic and one photo or, or something like that. Um, so we limited that to challenge them to find a way to share a lot of information creatively. So that takes a lot of planning. Now, how do you create an environment that is comfortable and warm and welcoming, particularly if it's a public meeting? Most people are not really excited about the idea of standing up in front of a group and sharing what they think. So how do we create a space that will be welcoming and comfortable to folks? Um, that has to do with the way the chairs are set up, the way that the room looks. Uh, it has to do with creating multiple ways for people to provide input. So do we have a survey and comment cards and a wall, you know, a wall covered in paper where folks can do art to express their opinions and their, their goals and their concerns. So really thinking about a lot of aspects uh, of the public engagement and also thinking a lot about folks who uh, have really strong feelings about something and how do we engage with them in a constructive way rather than feeling that we need to uh, have them follow our agenda in our way um, and with the kind of tone of voice and all the things that we're hoping for. But really, if someone's coming with strong feelings, how do we recognize that as um, valuable energy that we need um, to find a good way to channel into to moving forward? So having plans around that is important. And then design to promote problem solving rather than position demanding. So a lot of what we do is we have public meetings where folks get something like three minutes at the microphone, or we have surveys where folks get 150 characters or a bubble to check. And what we're inadvertently asking them to do is to, tell, to demand the one thing that you want, not to think collectively about what's important for, for our state and to um, consider the perspectives of other Minnesotans and to consider limitations and opportunities and barriers and challenges. Uh, and that's what we have to do when we make decisions. And so I think we do a disservice by saying to folks, tell us the one thing that you want, and then we will fail you in delivering that because we won't be able to deliver the one thing that you want because we have hundreds of people telling us the one thing that they want. It's not that we don't want to create space to know what people need and want. We absolutely do. Um, and there's some um, important equity concerns there to think about uh, who has space and privilege to voice. Uh, what's important to them and what their needs are and who hasn't been heard um, in the past. Uh, but still within that context, we can think about better ways to design public engagement that encourage folks to share their perspective, hear about their neighbors' perspectives, and help us as a decision maker think through what's the wisest way to move forward uh, that takes into account the most needs and concerns of the most Minnesotans. Next slide. Follow up. Again, I mentioned um, can be surprisingly challenging. Sometimes we can turn out a group of folks, but it's hard to get back to them. 
uh, particularly to communicate the nuance of how we used the time that they um, generously shared with us to participate in one of these processes. So I think the answer to that, again, lies in our partnerships with community-based organizations, whether those are nonprofits, churches, schools, units of local government. We need those partners to help us make connections uh, with a broad array of Minnesotans uh, and then help them to know when we need them to come and participate and give their input and how we've used that input and what our barriers have been and where we've been able to leverage things. And so those partners are really key along with traditional things like sending out a summary of what happened, posting things on a website, losing, using social media. The four C's is just a quick reminder, competence. So competence might look like, again, having a presenter who's able to convey information in a way that uh, is understandable to the folks who are attending. Caring might look like uh, things like providing food, or childcare, translation, transportation, those kinds of things. Uh, and caring, I think, is also about um, for us in government, really taking off our state leader hat and putting on our neighbor hat, our mom hat, our grandpa hat, um, and really being present for the people who show up, whatever that looks like, whether it's a public meeting, a, a dialogue, and a conversation that's a part of an ongoing relationship, a coffee, um, and really um, not being so wed to our agenda or our plan for the day, but really first being present with people and knowing that, that they come first and then the input or decision that we're looking to make. Uh, consistency, again, looks like things like staying in relationship, communicating back, uh, and communication we've talked about quite a bit. Um, setting high expectations. Uh, that means that um, quite a bit of public engagement today can get um, difficult or be challenging because folks have strong feelings about issues that are important to them. And again, that's not that's not a bad thing. We want folks to be engaged. We want them to care about things that are important in our community and in our state. Uh, but how do we come together with those divergent perspectives in a way that leads us to a good outcome? And sometimes something really as simple as talking about what our expectations are for working together, naming that our goal is to, to hear from everyone, um, to honor different perspectives, uh, to create space for uh, different ideas, naming some of our expectations uh, at the beginning of a meeting or the beginning of a, a group working together can go a surprisingly long way to create the kind of dialogue that we want to be able to have that both uh, makes space for difference and honors different perspectives and leads us to a, sort of a path towards a consensus and a way to move forward. And then create space and time to acknowledge missteps, anger, fear, and difference. Uh, I've talked about that a bit already, but again, uh, we have perhaps increasingly folks coming out uh, to our public engagement activities who have strong feelings about things. And sometimes we want to kind of squash that down or push it to the side and be able to stay on time and stay on our agenda, uh, thinking that that's going to be more efficient when really uh, it's more difficult. And so to be able to just take that time, um, have a plan and be able to address strong feelings talk with people, understand what their needs and concerns are, have different options for how to work through concerns, uh, but don't you know, try to, try to make it go away, rather try to understand it as an asset and figure out how we can work with it. So questions, comments, thoughts about these um, best practices and values for engagement? Mariah, thank you. Yes, uh, I uh, I really nerd out on all the uh, the engagement uh, pieces and and how to do this this uh, in a good way. Um, I just wanted to also mention because some of you may be thinking about the fact that there's also a public engagement task force itself, um, and we will be uh, ensuring that the the chairs of both task forces are talking to each other. There'll be an opportunity to engage to. Um, uh, see the the work that the 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 other task force is doing and and vice versa, so that we'll have an opportunity uh, to collaborate uh, when it's it's appropriate too. So just want folks to you know rest assured that 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 is uh, is will be happening and and is coming. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. So I know this is your first day together, um, but before we wrap up, I'm curious if you have any initial thoughts about how you may be able to apply some of this information about best practices and guiding principles to the work that you are just embarking on. Uh, 
this is Auditor Blaha. I, I think one question I have is, you know, we have these are great ideas for how we work, but how do these ideas look in a policy? I mean, how do they how do they show up in a policy uh, so they persist? You know, what are some of the things that you see to Maybe this is my parliamentary background too. It's like how how, how do we get this into a, a written thing that so that it actually happens? Yeah, that's a great point, auditor. And I know um, state agencies are increasingly developing community engagement plans, which is at least one place to look at how folks are articulating that. Those are you know plans or programs rather than official policies. But I think some of that language is developing there. Um, but that'll be that'll be part of your work. Other thoughts about how to apply some of this wisdom to the work that you're doing. The emphasis on promoting problem solving, I think, is this especially helpful to um, to our focus. So I appreciated that. Any final call, any other comments, questions, thoughts about any of this material? I just appreciated the very simple plan, plan, plan. Like I think we know what the problem is, quote unquote, that we're trying to solve. And if we can come up with a really solid plan around that, we should have a really good outcome. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree. Well, as I mentioned, all of these resources and more materials are available to you as you undertake your important work. Um, and I am available too if folks have questions or concerns or think that there's anything that I can do to, to help you with your important work, feel free to reach out. And I appreciate, I appreciated all of your, your stories that you shared this morning and the time that you're dedicating to this important work. So thank you. Thank you, Mariah. Okay. <sighs> Cleansing breath. Time to, to focus again on something uh, that's going to be really important to us. And um, this is our charter, which uh, outlines our, our responsibilities and our work. And um, we have a, a draft here that was also included in your uh, materials in the email that you received. So... Um, First of all, before we get into the um, details of the charter itself, um, our meeting today is being recorded. Um, do you have a preference on how the recording should be retained? Do we want to um, post it um, for later viewing or is there a... Um, an idea you have about a process going forward for how we deal with these um, recordings of our meetings, because this is a public meeting. Okay, I'm a teacher. This, I'm going to start calling this, on you. This is Julie. Uh, do we? How, how much choice do we have on some of that stuff? I'm kind of wondering, I know in our office, we have it all of our records retention and how we put that out. Um, what choices do we actually have? That's a good question. Eric. Sure, my my understanding, and if, if anyone from Cat Board had a different understanding on the sort of any records retention rules, my, my understanding is that we certainly have the obligation to, to have the uh, the meeting sort of available for the public for the, the live streaming, but that the sort of decision on retaining the recording would, would that there would be more flexibility on, on on other than just sort of offering the, the opportunity to view in real time. Are there, are there meeting notes that are made available at all? 
Yep, and that that could be a, a middle ground is is sort of providing providing notes afterwards, but not the recording. If that was was interest. I think we should post the recording so that people can follow along with the uh, progress of the task force, the discussion. Some people can't make the actual live stream, so I don't see any problem, given that it is a public meeting in the interest of full transparency, to post the, the Zoom recording on the website relatively soon after the meeting. Okay. <clears throat> with, an, with the alternative um, format, for not necessarily minutes, but notes in addition to the, the recording. I have to say, I always get a little concerned about notes just because it's so hard to capture what someone actually says without just saying what they said. Uh, and so I think there's a challenge there. I also think we should think about how we use our meeting chat. You know, again, it's a public meeting and how public does that have to be? I, I know in some of my meetings, I like to avoid using the chat so that if you're watching, you really are seeing everything. And, you know, there aren't side conversations that make you feel left out. Um, and as far as how you, records retention, I'm still figuring that part out, even in my office. <laughs> so. Eric, this I'm, might be, I'm sorry. I was going to say this might be a good question for Stacy Christensen in our data practices office, and we could just circle back with her and see what if there's a requirement for it. Okay. Hi, and this is Lindsay. You can also post the chat and along with the video. Um, and I would be curious in future meetings um, to understand what the communication plan is around around the meetings and where they will be, where it will be posted, where it will be shared specifically with social. That's where a lot of people get their, their if, if it is gonna be shared anywhere other than just the website. Okay. Those are certainly items that we can we can address. So we'll um, make sure that the recording is available. Oh, so you have your hand up. What did you speak? Uh, thank you, Chair. So I just have a question. With, I, I know that since we're going to be uh, uh, broadcasting this publicly, are is it the intention of the task force to have some kind of public engagement with members of the public too, or is it more internal discussion and just for folks to see the discussion? That's a good question. Um, Eric, do you want to follow up on that? Sure, sure. And I, I think that that certainly is, is all, all of this. And maybe when we get to the, the, the section and the towards the end of the charter about the about the timeline, I think that, that that's kind of uh, up, up for what the, the, the task force members are, are interested in. I think it also gets also ties into what the lieutenant governor had said earlier about how we have this other task force that is sort of specifically focused on on sort of active engagement with the uh, with the public and um, and sort of thinking about how the the task forces could 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 work together on that. Dana, <clears throat> I think that Eric, to that point, I have some confusion in my mind about the differences between the two groups, their interactions, the dis whether their tasks are discrete or in fact interacted. I mean, one way of looking at it from my perspective is that we just heard about public engagement because we're going to design a process. And that process needs to include public engagement. But per se, I had not envisioned that our group would be really actively involved in engaging the public. So maybe if we could have just some little greater clarity around the other group's task and how it is discrete from ours, that would be helpful to me. Okay. Sure. Madam Chair, if I could jump in here. Sure. Um, so, uh, so these are absolutely the questions that you, that, uh, you should be asking. And I think um, with regards to transparency and accessibility, I would just lean on being as transparent and as accessible as possible. These are public meetings. Um, video should be shared. The chat can be shared. Lindsay, to your point, determining uh, the, the best way to, to 
make sure that that folks can access this just because it's available on the internet it doesn't mean that folks know that it's here so uh, I, I hear that certainly for sure and I think the um, so the public engagement uh, task force is making recommendations to the cap board as to how we engage the public now and into the future on a whole host of of issues um, in the past, uh, and I'm sure that we'll we'll have this conversation. But you know, one of the the tools in the toolbox was to do surveys of people who are at the Capitol. Well, if you're already at the Capitol, it is accessible to you. Um, and you know, so I think that the challenge there is how do we connect with folks who might not uh, visit the Capitol, have never been here before, but it is still their house. How do we ensure that they are engaged in the conversation about um, what their capital uh, looks like and, and, and means to them? And that is the engagement process over um, uh, over the you know the the coming uh, decades. I guess is is the process that's being designed for um, for the process task force. Uh, this is specifically looking at uh, the public policy that recommendations that will be made to the cap board with regards to any alterations, uh, additions, removal of memorials or artwork at the Capitol itself. So, uh, Dana, to your point, I think, you know, there will be a public engagement process uh, or determination as to how to engage the public in determining the process for policy change. Uh, and that is part of what this group uh, will be um, engaging in. But also knowing that the public engagement task force itself um, will certainly have uh, feedback and ideas uh, to share with this task force as uh, we're engaging in that, that journey to get that, that feedback and engagement on the process itself. Is that helpful? Yes, I it's quite helpful, thank you. Yep, our goal here is to, to take a look at the policies and procedures that we have now and determine where there are gaps and opportunities for the public to have um, impact on the decision process. Right now, there is a serious lack of, of procedure for how the public can engage in this process. Okay. Um, is there anything in our task force charter that is missing? Um, or is there um, an aspect of it that you would like to see revised as we move forward? This is Eric. I, I have just a question on uh, item two under goals, mm -hmm. which is to identify gaps in policy or process um, regarding the, as follows. Um, as we review, are there also perhaps modifications or, or how do we talk about modifications to these things, not just the gaps, but maybe removal of some of the practices that we we feel have become dated. That I think will be part of our, our process here um, to take a look at what is there, what's missing, uh, what needs to be updated, um, and that that will be uh, a lot of our work. Um, and we can get into that into more detail as we start looking at the, the policies and procedures themselves. Um, we, we have a report uh, that will be delivered to the CAP board uh, with our suggestions and um, how we can interact with the, the other task force. And in a, in a future meeting, uh, uh, we can uh, review the charter of the other task force as well and see how our two groups are going to be working uh, in tandem uh, to have a process for public engagement um, and clear and transparent policies for uh, requests for changes. Okay. Any other Comments on our charter? It's 
Is there anything that doesn't belong there? Anything missing? We have um, some guidelines to help facilitate our discussion so that it's open and um, collaborative. Uh, I have a question against this. Uh, this is Julie. I have a question on the press inquiry thing. Um, mm -hmm. I'm guessing that, you know, people are going to still ask the lieutenant governor questions and things. We could speak on maybe the value of our work, but I think we're, we're just getting at the idea of talking about the specifics of it, correct? If a reporter asked me, I want to say this is a great idea, <laughs> you know, and I, and I think that that is in line with this, but I just want to know. If, if there are um, direct contacts uh, from, from the media to have uh, your um, ideas about the process or the, that you're happy to be on the task force, that's great. But if there are other requests about um, how we're moving along or requests for specific information about um, our discussions, um, if, if you could just forward those comments um to to the staff or to to me and then we can make sure we've got a consistent response going out did that help julie oh you bet okay Okay. Oh, Dana. I think the reason that you're hearing silence with respect to the charter document is that it's the result of really outstanding staff work. And I just want to commend the staff for having been very thorough. It's it's clear, it's crystal clear, it's crisp. Uh, it covers not just what we're going to do, but how we're going to do it. So I just want to commend staff. Yes. We can all do our applause icons for, for the staff. They have been absolutely wonderful to work with and make my job a whole lot easier. Okay, we are coming up on uh, the end of our meeting here. And if there are no other uh, comments about the, the charter, we'll move to the, the last item on our um, I think we have here. one, maybe one more hand that just came up here. Oh, okay. Yes, Jason. Hi, if we have suggested amendments to the charter, can we submit those for consideration? It says on tomorrow's agenda, finalize the charter. And then if we offer specific language amendments, those can be distributed to the group and then they can be considered as we, before we finalize that piece. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent suggestion. Thank you very much. And uh, right. Eric Anderson here, I'm probably a good person to receive those if you want to send those along later this afternoon. Great. Thank you, Eric. All right. For closing. This is going to be a challenge. Oh, Jason, you have your hand up again. Oh, OK. <laughs> Delay. Um, for closing, here's the challenge. One word on how you're uh, feeling after today's meeting. Um, I'll go first, and then uh, we'll go in alphabetical order again. So it'll be uh, Jason, then Dana, then Kate Bean, then Julie. And I'll kind of keep in, in control of the, the itinerary there. So one word, um, excited. Jason. Prepared. Dana. Encouraged. Kate. Julie. Ready. All right. Lindsay. 
Connected. Jessica. Ready. All right, lots of readies. Um, Eric. Hopeful. Good. Jennifer. Optimistic. Tish. Hopeful. Fu. Ready. Alice. Also ready. You? Oh, also ready. Okay. And Daniel. I'm also hopeful. Good. So that means everybody will be back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm happy that you're all here. It's I'm glad to meet you. I think we have a great group of people. Um, and just a reminder, our the second part of our meeting is tomorrow afternoon from one to three. And um, thank you for spending time here today uh, for this important work, and I'm really looking forward to it. So we'll see you tomorrow. And thank you to our staff for keeping us all prepared and organized. All right. We'll see you all later. Hey, Eric, we have ended recording.